This is Open Global Minds Weekly Thursday check-in call for January 20th, 2022. We just wander around the room and see what OGME thinks people have been up to. Uh, but first, Grace, thank you for, for taking us in yesterday, uh, yesterday <laughs> a week ago. Um, and there's just lots of energy. And thank you then also afterward for what you posted to the list um, about, about your activities and how to move forward. So partly I'm trying to figure out all those moving parts. Um, Tuesday, we have build OGM calls. And my intention was to talk about how to build scaffolding. Uh, and we ended up talking about something else the whole time, but, but uh, trying to figure out how to make this really fruitful so that you, know, you get support from OGM and it all kind of works out. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, Tuesdays for the next six weeks are just booked because of my workshop, although I don't know what time it is. If it's around this time, I could potentially show up. I just don't like I don't know where to look for the calls. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the, so the um, Tuesday and Wednesday, there's calls at 7 a.m. Pacific. So it's an hour earlier. That actually um, can work. And the Tuesday one is build OGM and the Wednesday one is weaving the world operations, which I may repurpose or it may, it may shift around. But the, but the build OGM calls, we wind up having really interesting conversations just about what is this funny amoeboid thing and how do we make it be more of what it might be? Uh, Pete, thank you for reminding me about the transcripts. All set. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, the whole fabric thing, it's really interesting. I don't know if you guys, guys know, but um, someone started a liminal web DAO discussion on a Discord server. Have you guys seen this? No. So uh, basically this guy, Jared um, Lucas, who actually did my workshop in the previous cohort and is involved in some AI stuff, started this to try and bring together these liminal web folks, whether that's, you know, rebel wisdom, the stoa, the intellectual dark web, and like kind of create a, a DAO, which the first paper that was written was not well thought out, but it was just this kind of call to people. And some, you know, and they've been having weekly calls, which are a little bit late at night for me. Um, I guess they're about something like 11 or 12 uh, noon Pacific time or something like that. And they're just these amazing, deep, interesting calls. And one of the things they're sort of talking about is before we say we're going to do something, let's figure out what we are and what we want. And there's this kind of um, respect for the fact that given the minds that are in the room, what we could invent might end up in the wrong hands. And I think OGM is in that same position. And that we need to sort of start to start formulate what this thing is. And one of the, I mean, the bottom line problem, obviously, is the bottom line, because that's why it's called the bottom. Anyway, which is we're all doing this great content and we're not getting paid for it. So it's kind of this spare time thing. And for some people, that's easier and some people that's more difficult. Um, but it was just, just this amazing conversation, this amazing Discord group, and it's, it's just forming. And there may be, you know, 20, 30 people on this call every week, and it goes for two or three hours. And it's really this just, who are we? Let's get to know each other. Let's establish the trust before we build things. And I think that OGM has kind of gotten to that point. Like we've kind of built the trust. We feel comfortable with another, one another. We don't think anybody here is gonna take this dangerous thing that we create and put it in the wrong hands. And now we're at the creation stage. So it's really interesting to see this other group forming and going through this thing. Uh, and there's certainly a parallel group and, and I'll put the discord chat here. Uh, I, I think it's really, you know, it's within, you know, there are people, there are people. <laughs> there are people. Um, it, it, it looks really interesting. What's the topic of this thing? I came in while you're in the middle of your. The yeah. liminal web DAO. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yes. The, the, somebody, Pete has, has done this. Uh, yeah. Ooh. This, okay. this uh, thing. And I'll, okay. I'll send the Discord link as well for people who want. Oh, look at that. All this. Stuff. I, can't, I can't do it as fast as Pete. I don't think Nobody anybody can. can. Um, and I did a, I did a quick uh, Google while you were talking. And I got the first hit was a video called Meta Modern Spirituality, the Liminal Web and Communitas. And the, the whole meta modernism theme I tripped across last year sometime un, under lockdown sometime and really rang my bell. It was like, wow, OK, this, this meta modernism thing could really work. I'm not entirely sure I can explain it to anybody yet. but. Uh, but it feels like a like a really good direction. <clears throat> here's, here's a quick picture. 
And you notice our friend Jim Rutt right there in the middle. Oh, man. And Rebel Wisdom. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Rebel Wisdom, Game B, Permaculture, a little bit of everything, hey? Hi. Well, I, my sense of everything is, Could you, you know, like. Can you grab a screenshot? Uh, yeah, there's a, I also put that link. That's just a blog post. There's a link okay. in the chat. Got it. Thank you. Go ahead, Grace. My, my sense of everything is, um, it's, it's funny, like it just as a physical sensation. I get this like little like cringiness because it's so white academic intellectual man all up here talking about stuff. It's been extremely difficult for me to break into this group. Um, and I'm white and um, intellectual. I've been in the crypto space five years. Like I get this cringy, like it's gonna be a bunch of us creating gorilla NFTs again. Like, like I'm like, oh, let it not be that please, you know, feeling. And, and, and also like, if you just look at those rings, they're very, it's an exclusive kind of group and that's okay, right? Like this is our little clan, this is our little culture. But there's something about it that it's like, if that's what sense making is, it's like, okay, it's a bu it's another bubble. It's another little filter bubble of only people who can. And, and you listen to some of these people, and you know that ninety percent of the population, is people who aren't even just who are intellectual but not native English speakers, is like, well, this is not accessible. So, yeah. That sounds really cool, Grace. Thank you for putting it in the conversation. Pete, were you about to jump in, or was, was that just an intake of breath? Uh, just and take a breath. I, actually, I had a quick question for Grace. You said it was Grace. You said it was hard to break into it, and was that hard because it was exclusionary, or hard because it's like, oh my gosh, yet another, you know, overly white, overly uh, cloistered. I think it's it's uh, it's a closed group. It's a close. It's uh, it's just very simple. If you look at these people, they've all got quite popular podcasts in which they interview one another, and then if somebody's in, they get passed from one podcast to the other. And if you're not in, you're not in. That's really interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of communities where there's sort of mutual gatekeeping, and they attend one another's things. Um, yeah, and, and and they're sort of um, insular, impermeable, whatever the right word is. They're you know they. they they create an ecosystem of their own and they're happy to stay within it. And anybody in OGM would fit in to their demographic, but if you're not in, you're not in. OGM is very open door. So OGM is is not insular and not impermeable or? No, it was like I joined a call and I had didn't have, there was no gatekeeping. Somebody said, you should join this call and I joined the call. Yeah. Is that yeah. not the case with these other ones? More, more gatey? Uh, they're they're much more moderated in terms of there's a moderator of a conversation mm -hmm. like that like there's a jerry except their jerry decides who talks and it's not not everybody gets a turn right their jerry is like talks too except i try to make it so that everybody gets a turn yeah and <laughs> and in their thing it's like we're going to hear from these four people this week okay so is this kind of self-referential more highly moderated constellation a good thing or a bad thing? Is it powerful? Does it build something that we don't build or is it creepy or how do we think about it? My assessment is that it's really interesting for about three or four months and then it's like, okay, mm -hmm. I've okay. learned what these people have to say. <clears throat> well, it's interesting. We don't have, we as OGM haven't looked around and some of us have very active lives in other communities, but we haven't kind of looked around a lot actively and said, hey, who's out there and who's making a lot of progress and who has a good ethos uh, and who has good practices and like whose community can we can we uh, rub shoulders with or borrow some practices from or things like that. We haven't done, done a lot of that. Um, and I have this feeling that there's some, there's some really deeply sort of insular inward facing conversations that are interesting but trapped out going on. And then there's some really like open but like the future is happening right now in front of us. It's, you know, the, the people, the people who will be referenced 200 years from now are busy doing their thing right now. Um, so they're just out there. I mean, what, what my, one of my questions is, has for a long time been, who was I using? I was, I was like, who is the Alice Miller of our time? 
like like who, who's going to crack the code on some important piece of how society works how people works you know which of which of these many theories actually um actually works um grace do you want to continue a little bit just by way of check-in and then i'll i'll take us around the room a little bit more i'm just going to say me and you know we can move on this cool. is any such to your question but yeah i've been um i've been my workshop got completely booked up. I had to close registrations. Um, so that's been really exciting, keeping me busy. And I've been working on a little pitch deck that I'm gonna, um, I sent it to my graphic artist today. And so I'll be able to pitch the money thing that I'm working on uh, once she gets through it. And I'd love your feedback. So that's me. That sounds great. Thank you, that's wonderful. Um, let's go Doug, Pete, Michael. Well, uh, I find myself kind of self-dominated by the simple thought that of all the talk that's going on, nobody hardly is talking about uh, uh, what to do if we start to fail, what kind of backup plan, uh, what kind of contingency, uh, and that, well, I'll just stop, that's the key thought. Um, it's a very rare thing to find somebody's going to talk about uh, what we do if things start falling apart. Is the deep adaptation community cover that for you, or are you aware, aware of them? Because Jim Bendel and a bunch of people are off trying to figure out, hey, just doing little things isn't going to work. You know, things are breaking. We're going to have to figure out how to survive when things break. Uh, no, I'm not aware of that group. I should be. But there's so many groups. It's part of the problem. Uh, that is probably a problem. And, and, we have a super conductive communications medium where we can all like i remember a brief moment when i started creating videos and i was like ah where am i going to host these like like the, really seriously how am i going to put these up and make them available and, and think then, about the go yeah. ahead and then youtube and then google buys youtube and i'm like wait what why did you isn't that just a suck of energy and what how and now it's like i don't know exactly how i would live without youtube so the people in the dark web stuff uh, seem to me characterized by two, three things. First, uh, they're very athletic. They've got a lot of energy. Uh, second, uh, they tend to be uh, very smart. Uh, third, they tend to be uh, extremely well self-educated. Uh, and four, they seem to be somewhat conspiracy minded. And it's hard to deal with that, but it's like, I'm sure many things like that are going on around the world. For Can sure. you say more about conspiracy minded, what you mean by that? Well, they tend to uh, us versus them view of the world, where us is a very small number and them is uh, huge forces. Um, and uh, so they tend to discount the possibility of dialogue into the major part of the population. Um, I'll... They're also beginning to raise money. Uh, uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger, for one, uh, seems to be drawing money from somewhere. Um, I'll just add a little bit from my brain. So here's the intellectual dark web. It has a Wikipedia page, et cetera. And there's a, uh, an article in Salon, Godless Grifters, How the New Atheists Merged with the Far Right. And Dawkins, <laughs> Torres, Bogosian, Lindsey Krauss, Shermer, Pinker, you know, Sam Harris, like there, there's a whole bunch of uh, people in this intellectual dark web. And it does, uh, Grace, for me also, it has this connotation of, of conspiracist and uh, some, some very deep, hard thinking and some really interesting different points of view. And then a bunch of stuff that's like, oh, crap, really? And, and I think that's what we have to puzzle our way through together it's like it's like well this stuff you just said like i'm completely on board with and this stuff over here where'd that come from and how do we how do we sort of cool our jets collectively and have those conversations anyone else with thoughts on to me that's telling um that particular article of a society in which when you have views that fall into several categories, right? Like you said, some of these things, yeah, some of these things, no. They're like, far right, right? Like if you've got this one opinion, like, I don't know, whatever, then you, you know, and I think that's one of the things that that particular article kind of fell into, but also, yeah, okay, I, I get what you're saying. 
Um, it's interesting because there seems to be a small constellation of beliefs that kind of go together. There's like a basket of beliefs that aren't necessarily related, um, that, that, that sort of seem to be a package. And Even, if well, you buy yeah. one, you wind up going into the others. Um, and I don't, I, I'm interested in other people's uh, sort of opinions or theories on this, but, but um, it's interesting to me how a collection of things, some of which are sensible and some of which are not sensible, all get locked together sometimes in really interesting ways. John. Yeah, so I'm going to take just a, one of these slices, and I think, well, we'll see. <laughs> I think Grace will agree with me. This is this is troublesome territory. This is where a, a lot of things run afoul, or, or or get very difficult to to uh, to manage. So, my sister is. See, now we get into this word. I, I was about to say anti-vax, and even she, you know, she's a. Uh, a deep Steiner person she follows Rudolf Steiner and she lives in a community that is, you know, eh, you know, and, and, and the ant eh is all over the place for some of it's like, eh, oh, my current, you know, we're going to get it. You're going to get it. Yeah, it's a flu. And, oh yeah. If you're, if you're old or you got diabetes, well, you know, you should have taken better care of yourself, but yeah, you're going to, you might die. You might die. You know, oh, and we'll, you know, we, I seriously, we would show up. We would, we would be at your bedside. We would pray for you. We would, Hold you, but I mean, you know, don't do this vaccine thing just because a half a percent or one percent of the population is going to die from it. Don't do that. Don't do that because that puts the ninety-nine percent that injects something that's untested, and 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 then there's the whole conspiracy group that says, "Oh no, it's it it was very well tested. It's it's graphene. It's going to get in your body, and that's how you know." And 5G is going to come along, and and then you're going to be controlled because you you accepted the vaccine. And it's really tough, even with really smart people, to navigate the nuance and to say, well, okay, you could have, you, you know, there's a there's a very reasonable basis for, um, you know, saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, this thing was not sufficiently tested. I'm not ready to do that. The next question is, you know, now you get into the Djokovic thing. You say, well, as a responsible human being, therefore, I should put a mask on. That's what I would say. You know, if you say, you know, I got some concerns about the vaccine. Um, I understand that. I understand it. Put the mask on because you're running around in public. But the problem is that the same people who ah, I got some concern about the vaccine are also I got some concern about the government and the kind of health people and Fauci and the Chinese and da, 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 da. and so I'm therefore not going to wear a mask. And you go, wait a minute. <laughs> that, that doesn't, you know, it's really, really hard to thread the needle with, with all those folks. And this has just been my experience, Dan, and I'm still struggling with it. I, I don't know if, uh, you know, some of the rest of you can probably chime in and, and uh, shed some light on this. Pete. I don't know about shedding light, but um, can you throw some shade on this? <laughs> I can't do that either. <laughs> um, uh, I just, I just wanted to note that this, this is a, an interesting and to this group probably uh, kind of uh, uh, ticklish burr under our saddle uh, to be thinking about these folks. And and I wanted to say, by the way, I I think one of the things that we need to do more of is to look. I don't know if up is the right direction, maybe down is the better direction, but um, I think a lot of the, I, I think a lot of our world is manipulated by, by people that we don't really think about, people and organizations that we don't really think about very much. So when I see people making a lot of noise, it's like, well, why are they making a lot of noise and who's encouraging them to make a lot of noise and who set up the kind of the societal conditions in which that kind of noise gets made and spread right um some sometimes that's kind of an emergent property of our society but i think also sometimes it's um, a billionaire or um you know a, a handful of billionaires uh or um or foreign act uh, foreign nations or whatever right I, th I think we have a lot of manipulation going on um purposeful manipulation going on that that we account for as like oh my god that person is doing something x you know and it's like yeah you know that person and a bunch of other people and maybe that's 
now I sound like a conspiracy theorist. Maybe that's um, um, a bigger, more diffuse uh, action going on. The 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 poster kids for uh, this for me are the the uh, Cook brothers, if I'm pronouncing their name correctly. Um, and you mean Coke, Charles, and yeah, the Coke yeah. brothers. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, or. I guess they're a good example. Rupert Murdoch is another good example of, of somebody who just did a bunch of manipulation. And, and as far as I can tell, he just did it because he was a griefer, a berserker. Um, uh, the Koch brothers, you know, got lucky, won the, the kind of the familial and uh, business lottery, and then thought that that was because they were brilliant and smart and, and passionate and knew all the right things, right? And so then they spent the rest of their lives spending billions of dollars on thousands of little things all over the place that, you know, unless you pull back and start drawing maps, you, you don't really, you can't conceive of how big their influence was because it's just distributed all over the place, right? And that's, I think, an easy example to look at. I think there are, are trickier ones where there's, you know, millions of, of things that look disconnected until you can pull far enough back and go, they're probably connected. Stuart, then I think Doug. <clears throat> yeah, very briefly, I, I think we were all brought up in some sense to think that we're important, <laughs> that each of us as a, as a little individual <laughs> is important and not realized, you know, how unimportant we are as a, as a tiny cell in, in this large living body um, called Gaia or the universe. And add to that the, the whole notion that we were brought up to be um, competitive uh, and not think that much about other people. And um, if you add those two things up, uh, it really reeks for trouble in the future. I mean, and, and that, that, this whole notion of everybody having an opinion and people focused on, you know, it's my right, it's my right as my right, as opposed to having some level of responsibility for the larger community. Um, Doug, did you want to jump in? Well, just to say that I think that the anti-vaxxers and the people like Daniel Schmachtenberger are on really different sides of this question. Uh, I think that Schmachtenberger and Sam Harris and that group uh, want to maintain an independence from, I mean, it's, they are as critical of the bad sense making as we are. Uh, I think it's, if you haven't, looking at uh, Schmachtenberger's consiliancy project is really worthwhile. Uh, he's a, uh, very smart about game theory. He's very smart about history. Uh, he puts it together in ways that are just really worth listening to. And some of the people he pals around with are pretty good, uh, and they do good interviews with each other. I just wish some of Schmachtenberger's materials were shorter. I think Grace knows this. I'm like, does he have anything that's brief, anything at all that's brief? And I found like a six minute video, which I'll post in the chat, which is actually brief. And I'm like, okay, this is good. And it's just a, a narrative with some fancy, fancy uh, uh, video art, basically stock, stock video footage. But, but the words I really agree with, like I, I liked it a lot. So I'll find that. Um, Mr. Carranza. There's something that I've noticed over time um, watching the intellectual dark web is when they accrue followers, their behavior changes slightly. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how to put this, either the celebrity effect or um, what was it called before? The power of the, um, the bottom, something like that, um, where um, it just seems, and you know, this is, possibly a, and certainly a prejudice of mine that the need to maintain attention, to maintain a revenue stream, to maintain followers, um, I'm allergic to it. And um, it seems to be a, a thing that um, is a very large force in the way that we need to connect through media. Um, 
and I'm not exactly sure what to do about it, but I see it, I call it out, and I, I wonder, huh, um, I, I used to call it look at meism, and, you know, I, I'm just not exactly sure where to come down, either, yes, the people who are making a lot of noise deserve to make a lot of noise, or yes, the people who are making a lot of noise have ulterior motives, and shut them up now. <laughs> I just, I just don't know. But there's something there. Um, thanks, Mark. Um, it's interesting. I'm reminded of uh, the moment I realized after Hillary lost to Trump in 2016, I realized that I had set aside all of my deeply held beliefs about how screwed up the system is and how we've designed everything from mistrust and how institutions are like ass backwards and all that. I'd set all of that aside to vote for the person I was hoping would be the first woman president of the United States. Because, I, because unconsciously I knew she was a steward of the status quo and sort of entirely part of the engine that was feeding all those things I don't like that I would like to redesign. And I, and I had, I harbored no hope that she was gonna take a radical approach toward those issues and reestablish trust and do other kinds of things. You know, Having watched her for three decades fight off you know, assaults and, and, and whatever, and I think that inures you also. It's like you stop, you stop wanting to try to listen to anybody, uh, and then uh, and then a second thing I want to put in the conversation is that it used to be that you know the Andy Warhol everybody has fifteen minutes of fame. We are in an era of instant, almost random celebrity where things go viral for good and bad, and suddenly you're in the spotlight, and it's really hard to erase it, and, and your life is transformed, and who knows what happens there. And school kids growing up with cell phones and TikTok are like, mm, maybe this one. And, and, and it's like it's like in the back of our heads, everybody kind of knows that, that maybe, and some people I think really hope for this, and, and that means that they pitch themselves more radically, more aggressively, more whatever, because that's how you get attention. So there's, there's, there's forces and feedback mechanisms here that are new, that we haven't figured out how to make productive, that don't really help us uh, with society. And then my, like, my quest for the last 30 years has been about the word consumer. So I have a whole narrative about the consumerization of our lives. And instead of being citizens anymore, we're mere consumers. And when you're a citizen, you actually care about the things we're talking about here, interdependence, the fabric of society, relationships, how things get done together, common outcomes, all that kind of stuff is like a part of citizenship. And consumers are just supposed to buy more stuff or the economy will come to a halt and then there's gonna be a global disaster. And we, we all know that that narrative doesn't really actually work because we're heading toward a global disaster because of that attitude, right? It's like, that, that's so completely backwards. And yet we're just completely inside that system and take it for granted. We don't, we don't really work hard to, to, to change it. And I think some of the groups we're talking about here are working hard to change it in very radically different ways. And some people have a really big microphone. Um, Gil. Um, yeah, a bunch of things. Mark, I wonder if your distrust of the attention seekers may be related to the fact that you have a job. Whoops. Uh, Mark, you're muted. Yeah, it came, came way before that. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I'm not to single you out, but the point of you know, for for those of us who are who are itinerant craftspeople and artists of the of 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 the of the bright web, we're sort of stuck in that game, to some degree. Uh, and whether it's you know building podcasts or learning academies or selling consulting services or whatever it is, we're you know, we're 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 somehow in that ongoing self promotional thing. In the way that you're not, if you have a job that's going to be a twenty year career and you go to work and get a paycheck, it's a different different kind of game. Um, on, on the Hillary thing, Jerry, I, I, I feel you. And I had a kind of moment of Ken show um, with Obama, who was yet again a Democratic presidential candidate who was not my choice uh, among the whole, con who I voted for. And I realized some point in that process that I thought, you know, um, I don't agree with him about everything, but on, you know, on balance, that's where I'm gonna go. And I realized, wait a minute, I don't even agree with myself on everything. So looking for complete unity of agreement with somebody, candidate or friend or anything else, just like, you know, sort of left my, left my constellation at that point. I realized things are much more complex and nuanced and shifty uh, for me to understand that. But I, I wanna come back to Doug's uh, provocation about what if everything starts to fail? Um, and um, 
that's a real consideration for me now in a way that it hasn't been for a really long time. And uh, you know, we talk about it as conspiratorial, but it's also a kind of steely eyed taking assessment of what we're looking at in the world and what has brought us to the state that we're in today. Um, and it's, you know, it's not just climate. I mean, climate's, climate's a symptom, not a cause. Uh, we've got biodiversity decline. We've got potential ecosystem collapse at a vast scale. Uh, we've got toxification of living systems uh, at a vast scale, something we're very concerned with because Jane, who's a uh, dealing with multiple myeloma, has found pretty, to her, pretty persuasive evidence of the impact of glyphosate uh, in the uh, etiology of that disease. And when you start looking at glyphosate, the stuff is fucking everywhere. Um, Monsanto has played its game very well. And so, you know, there's, there's the possibilities of economic decline, climate decline, biological decline, the impact of, of immune status on future pandemics and on and on and on. Uh, and the little matter of capitalism that gets very little talked about uh, in all these stories. Uh, and the matter of power, which gets almost never talked about. I mean, in all the discussions I see about economics, no one's talking about power. And concentration of power and manipulation of power. So not to not to you know feed conspiratorial fires, but it's a it's a it's a complex mess, as Russ Acoff used to talk about. Not a problem, but a mess. It's intertangled, and um, the pieces pull on each other. So you know, um, I've been finding that to be a, re a a real challenge to my congenital optimism, which is sort of where I've lived for as long as I can remember, and I. Um, this was triggered in particular by watching Don't Look Now at the end of last year, which took me Don't into look a up. Don't Look Up. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, which took me to a mood that I hadn't felt for decades. Uh, and immo I was immobilized for a couple of days. I clawed my way back out of it and I'm back at work and actually work is thrilling at the moment. Um, you know, the, the individual actions that we take in the face of the cosmic goop with the, this up, up in the thread above there, I think is really important. Um, so, um, but Doug, what do you, you know, what do you do if everything starts to fail? You know, do you, you know, do you build monasteries that can preserve knowledge and manuscripts? And There's lots of good science fiction with uh, suggestions. There's, yeah, and, and, and some history. Uh, and what do we do personally um, you know, do we, do we stay here? Do we leave here? Um, where do we put ourselves in the economy? How do we take care of ourselves physically? What kind of communities do we build? Which is fact, you know, I'm much more attracted to this kind of community than to the, than to that intellectual dark web graphic or whatever it was that we saw earlier on. Um, but this is weird, you know, because I don't get to walk with most of you or hug any of you or, you know, have extended, you know, extended um, evenings together in a cozy space and all the things that we used to do. And I, I really relish, I miss the physicality mm -hmm. of contact. I've, I, I've been, I've been, you know, I've adapted to Zoom very well over the past couple of years, but the loss of the tactile is really starting to get to me. It's embarrassing. Gil has a scratching post in his living room that he's just like hugging. <laughs> Um, that's why I go off camera every now and then. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and, and, and Jerry, to the thing you, you were saying about, about consumer, um, uh, I, I've, I, I've, I've been kind of running the same meme for a long time myself. And, uh, um, you know, yes to everything you said. And also, you know, if you think about it in ecological terms, there is no consumption. There's only transformation. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I take in materials, I put out materials, my, my material basis changes. There's nothing, there's nothing consumed. It's all changes form and consumption uh, as a term used to be what we call tuberculosis. TB back in the day. Yeah. yeah. It was this, you know, disease that would eat you out from the inside. And now it's something that we prize. And like you said, you know, if we don't shop the terrorists, we'll have one. Even while Biden talks about build back better and an aggressive climate plan, which we're not going to see. They talk about, well, we got to buy more shit, all of which drives climate disaster. Thanks, Gil. Um, Ken, and then let's go back to the queue. Good morning. Um, Thank good you. evening, wherever you might be, afternoon. Um, a lot of, as always, so many things to talk about. Um, 
one on the issue of power. Uh, it really disturbed me when Obama came into office that he did not work diligently to take away and undo some of the powers that Congress granted to Bush after 9-11, which were broad and sweeping and really horrifically um, misplaced. Um, I think there's a conversation missing in our public sphere about power. Uh, the original intent of setting up um, uh, the three branches of government was to have checks and balances so nobody became too powerful. And we have now eroded that pretty effectively to where there's this huge concentration of, of power. And we're seeing this even with the minority, you know, you get, you get Mitch McConnell and, and the Republicans able to block uh, minority rule, majority rule, you know? So um, it's just very disturbing to me that that has never been um, addressed in the last 20 years since, since 9-11. And I don't know how to get that conversation going in the public sphere. Um, flipping completely to a different place, uh, some of you know that I went off of social media at the beginning of the year as part of my dryuary. Um, I, I stop, you know, drink alcohol and I go off social media and I've decided not to go back to Facebook until something changes there because I just, you know, when I weigh out, I love my birthday, I get 300 people wishing me have a birthday. That's fantastic. And then there's genocide. They don't equate. I can't be on that, you know, with that, knowing that I'm contributing to that kind of, of business model. So, um, you know, I'm really looking at uh, 20 years ago when I took my coaching course, um, I was put on a media fast, which is very hard for me. I thought I'd become an idiot. I was told you can't read any books, no magazines, no newspapers, um, no watching the news, no watching TV. I was like, you need to just chill and just empty yourself. And I thought, how am I going to do this? And I discovered that in the process of that, in coaching, we talk about moods as predispositions to action. And the mainstream media absorbing the news every day led me to a mood of feeling outraged and powerless, which was not a good feeling and not something I wanted to really uh, encourage in myself. So now I'm kind of having the same thing where I'm off social media going, you know, uh, am I going to become irrelevant? I'm not, I don't, I'm not putting stuff out there. Uh, what happens to my business? Uh, no one's going to see me. We've and, forgotten about you already entirely. Yeah, I know. That's why I had to show up today. Right. So, um, you know, there's this this tension between how do I participate in this crazy ass world um, and do so in a way that that feels like there's some integrity and some some ethical basis behind it, and that requires going into some very you know polluted waters. Um, you know, no one's no one gets away clean here. So um, those are just a couple of things on my mind that that were stirred by this conversation. The last thing I want to say about conspiracy. I don't know, 25 years ago, I read David Corton's book, When Corporations Rule the World, and he was talking about conspiracy theories. And, and I think it was a Filipino economist, um, or maybe a Brazilian economist, but the guy said, you know, by the time you get to run, if you reach the C-suite of a Fortune 500 corporation, it's very unlikely you're going to be a conspiracy theorist. You know, you are way too independent and, and uh, thoughtful to be able to do that. However, when there's an ideology around uh, neoliberal economics, it shows up from the outside. When you look at it and go, that looks like a conspiracy because these people are basically doing anything they can to concentrate wealth and power. And so it's not so much a conspiracy as it is an ideology. And I think that actually plays into the hands of people who are um, open to conspiracy kind of thinking because they can point to these things and say, see, see, that's what that is. And they don't have the framework to say, actually, that's because there's this neoliberal capital um, capitalism ideology at work here. And it's not a conspiracy, but it sure looks like one because the results look very similar. End of my rant. Thanks, Ken. Uh, let's go Pete, Kevin, Michael Gill. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to run through, I, I read up a list of things on my mind and I'm going to post that in the chat and run through them real quickly. Thanks. Um, uh, and I apologize or don't apologize or whatever. This is not, this all seems very prosaic. Uh, we're, we're on a kind of a uh, existential terror today and <laughs> this feels like it's not. So, um, uh, so, uh, 
Rob O'Keefe came up with this great idea of, hey, we should have like a monthly update of what's going on in OGM. Um, he mentioned that on one of the channels and we've kind of batted it around for a few messages. I, I, I'm really tempted to start something I'm thinking of. The, the code name is biweekly bi Plex Dispatch, um, which would be kind of a newsletter about what's going on um, in uh, around OGM, OGM and the, the places around that, that at least I know of. So look for that. Look especially for me sending an email probably to the OGM list, maybe to Mattermost saying, hey, uh, do you have any news for the next edition of, you know, whatever this thing is going to be called. Um, the OGM forum is a, a really cool experiment we had using discourse um, in 2021. Um, maybe 2020. Um, uh, it was pretty active, but we kind of ended up shifting away from it. Um, it it requires some energy and and uh, investment to maintain it, even if we're not using it. And so, um, me and some of the folks maintaining it are are uh, expecting to close it down uh, so that we don't have to spend energy maintaining it. Basically. Um, uh, hopefully nobody is sad about that if you're super sad about that not in an existential way uh, super sad like oh i was just about to post something there and we were going to have an, this amazing conversation and oh my gosh you can't blow it away um uh, uh if it's that kind of conversation get a hold of me if it's like oh i'm sad that we don't discuss in cool places uh yeah we discuss in lots of cool places so don't worry about it um uh, the Collaborative Tech, uh, Technology Alliance, another a really cool group that some of us are, are um, connected with, um, has, has started to tiptoe its way into probably using CSC Mattermost as it's kind of one of its core chat um, uh, places. Uh, so uh, if you see new folks um, wandering around the halls of CSC Mattermost, say hi and, and be pleasant and all that kind of stuff. Or be yourself, whether or not that's pleasant or not, whatever. Um, a real quick mention, uh, Wendy Elford and I are doing this cool thing, um, which is there's a, a pattern of a, a talk like this that's recorded that has a transcript that could have a transcript that then gets um, uh, digested, woven, um, uh, uh, and I'm starting to call this, starting to think of this as knowledge facilitation, taking the artifacts of of a, a live thing and um, annotating and adding value to it with links and and a good transcript and stuff like that. Um, a number of us in different places have been kind of talking through that that this gets done mostly in the abstract. Mostly we haven't been doing it. Um, it's really cool when he, Alfred and I kind of like backed into ending up really doing this for real and there's a real life website with nice pictures and graphics and design and stuff like that um, it's a very short website there's only like three or four pages um, but it's coming together really well and it feels really really productive and fun to see it coming together so i i can't show it yet we're we're putting the finishing polish uh finishing touches on it but um uh we we did that and uh, it's going to get released soon and we want to do more of it and I think a number of us want to do more of it and a number of us want to see that happening more in general so um, I, I maybe that's a little bit of a signpost for it's actually happening. Um, some of you have, have heard me talk about uh, um, I'm, I'm really passionately interested and have been for a long time in community currencies. Um, uh, I want to I want to do an intercommunity community currency uh, with OGM and some of the other communities. Um, and the money conversation was really interesting and, and kind of delayed me kind of talking about the community currency idea because I wanted to get more clear on the idea of, of money and, and what especially a community currency experiment, if we were to try that, would be. Um, and for me, the uh, the I, the code name for this is Sprig. I'm not crazy about the name, but I don't hate it either. Um, the the reason I would want to be doing a community currency experiment is not for all of the possible reasons that there we could be doing an experiment like that, and I don't necessarily need everybody to participate even. But um, the things I really want to explore are micropayments, the the capability for micropayments, and then also using money-like things uh, as uh, signaling, signaling mechanisms, peer-to-peer um, -peer signaling especially, but also kind of 
you know, what does this group think? Um, and the way that would work with a community currency is somebody like Pete says, hey, you know, should I do X project, Y project, or Z project? Um, and, you know, let's let's put some of our, our funny money paper paper tokens towards one or the other um, or, or all three or whatever. Um, so uh, the money conversation made me realize that um, we, we have lots of different ways of thinking about money and, and, um, and, and most of them aren't particularly interesting to me, maybe as a way to say it, um, but there are a few that are super interesting and they're not necessarily the mainstream ones kind of. So thinking of money as a signaling mechanism um, and a voting mechanism is something that's, I think, going to be really hard for people to go, but money's a store of value, you know, and it's like, yeah, um, if you think about it the right way, and if it's the right kind of monopoly money, you know, you know, you can kind of look at monopoly money, for instance, and go, well, this is obviously not a store of value, it's, it's tokens in a, in a, in a game that we play, right, so that's kind of where I want to go with that community currency experiment, so I'll write up more about it and talk more about it. Um, Maybe maybe kind of a really big thing, Jerry and I and some of the Build Joe Jam folks have talked about where conversations happen. So we have a really interesting conversation, um, uh, it kind of in progress, uh, the money one. And then there was the Civil War one, which is also interesting. Um, I think uh, J Jerry and I talked about this and came to kind of a conclusion, but then we had to quit before we actually wrote up the conclusion. So um, um, maybe, so I, I've got my, my memory of <laughs> how that ended up. Um, uh, the mailing list is an interesting place to have a conversation, but it's, it's, uh, it's also a little bit difficult. It gets kind of wound up and, and tangled and stuff like that. Um, the OGM forum is another great place to have that kind of conversation. We kind of demonstrated to ourselves um, uh, that, you know, for one reason or another, whatever reason, um, we're probably not going to use the OGM forum. Um, so I think my guess is Jerry is going to make a Mattermost channel for money and a Mattermost channel for, um, for maybe the Civil War topic. And maybe we'll continue some of the conversation there. Not everybody's going to make it over to Mattermost. So I, would, I expect some of the conversation to continue to happen in the, the email list. Um, I expect some of the conversation to continue to happen in Zoom calls. Um, uh, this is so. This is a big evolution for me from two years ago when I thought about o where OGM should have conversations. Um, I'm now much more of the, the opinion that they we have conversations where they're easy to have conversations, and demonstrably that's Mattermost Zoom email list. Um, the thing that the thing, and, and then you know, there, and then there's a wish that oh, I wish there was a more permanent archive of things, or a, a more organized place where we could see you know what the, the things that we talked about are. Um, uh, and so we've experimented with a wiki, the forum, um, uh, Miro. Uh, I, I, I don't see mass participation in any of those happening. But I do see people who are super passionate about wikis or forums or Mira or whatever. So my guess is, is where we go from here is that uh, people like me who are passionate about one of those mediums um, that is kind of hard for most people to use effectively, really participate in, feel like they're at home in. Um, uh, I, I think there should be a, a few more of people like me who just library the, the heck out of things. Um, and those library librarian folks should get together a little bit more and talk about that and maybe grow the practice of doing that. And then especially, most critically for me, do that in a way that, because um, each of us has our favorite library building. Mine is a wiki, you know, sometimes it's a forum, sometimes it's a mirror, sometimes it's Kumu, uh, sometimes it's Airtable or something else. Um, let's let's go ahead and use those tools but make them usable for other people so miro people can log in and wander around and, and see things um, massive wikis have a have a way to turn thing massive wikis into websites that just look like regular websites um, let's make it so those things are 
visible and viewable as archives, um, even if they're not participatory in that way, and then let's make them interoperate as much as possible. And so that's partly technology and partly what we like to call IP or licensing or something like that. Um, I get really cranky whenever we even start to talk about licensing because I think the whole thing is, I, IP is just stupid to me. It's just like, and, it, it, and it's crazy making. Um, uh, so it, it, it really rankles me even to be thinking about it. But <laughs> um, obviously, it's, so, and one, one, one practice for that, and I don't do this, sometimes I do and sometimes I don't, a lot of things just are, so we have, we have an IP regime and we have licensing regimes and stuff like that. So unless you are affirmatively not participating in the, like if you say, this is, this is public domain, if you affirmatively, if you don't say that, if you just kind of like ignore the problem because it's rankles you, um, your thing is essentially locked up, you know, it's legally locked up at least, whether or not people break the law and steal, steal your stuff and, and you know, share it. Um, anyway, so, um, so technical interoperability, but also licensing interoperability. Um, uh, make sure that, you know, as we're making these archives of amazingly wonderful stuff, that somebody like me, if it's in, if it's in Miro or if it's in um, Kumu or wherever, you know, please make it so that other people can go, well, I can't use Miro, but I can certainly use a massive wiki and, and I'm just going to lift and shift it. Um, and, you know, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I'm not, I don't want to step on, I don't want to steal your stuff if you don't want me to. So um, uh, part of interoperability is also licensing, and I hate the term. Um, my favorite license, by the way, is something called copy art. Um, and you can say it in different ways, but basically the, the message is uh, copying is an act of love. Please share, you know, copy the heck out of this because, you know, that's love sharing. So um, uh, last but not least, um, maybe uh because we talked a little bit about facebook um I've, I've got a link in um uh in the chat to a, a short essay by david weekly uh david is somebody that that i know pretty well he was a, a wiki person and probably some of the silicon valley people here know him um uh, he worked for facebook a long time he's a smart guy uh he um he he came up with an interesting thing he's like okay so all this hyper sharing facebooky kinds of stuff not just facebook but um he thinks that it led to a uniform uniformity of closeness if going into the idea of like oh wow facebook is going to let you share with you know distant people and close people and it's all going to be wonderful and maybe the distant people will get closer and the close people will get even closer he's like you know it seems like what happened is everybody kind of like got uniformly close uniformly close so you don't end up being um, super intimate on Facebook generally. You you end up being kind of distant, even with your close friends. You you say things that look pretty and sound pretty and and stuff like that. So everybody, the the close people, end up kind of getting farther away in, when you're sharing on social media, and then the the far people end up getting you know about the same distance. So he kind of end up ended up thinking that's that's the way it works. He's he's ends it in a hopeful note. He's like, okay, so those of us who are tool makers can start to work on this problem and make it so, you know, we have different ways of sharing that preserve and enhance each of the ways that each of the modalities we have um, in sharing distance instead of like collapsing it all into like arm's length kind of. So um, thanks. Um, Pete, thank you. There's like 15 things I want to say and we have Richard, Grace and Doug, but however, um, Kevin Jones asked to step in for a bit and he's got to step off the call briefly. So I'd love to go Kevin and then if the three of you who were like eager to speak want to take a quick note so you don't forget what, uh, what you want to say, please, uh, Kevin. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I've, I've uh, as if you look at the list, you know, I love the money thread, but oddly enough, uh, some people have reached out to say, tell me more what you think about money. So I've been writing more targeted to them and figuring out what I really think about it. And it's been really helpful to me. On, on the hope thing, I, yeah, I'm leading a class for my grandsons and Stephanie, a uh, black woman who also leads our funds grandsons on the true cost of a Tesla. And one, they're, they're, they're concerned about whether their generation should hope. And uh, it's a real serious discussion. They're seeing things that are hopeful, but they wonder if they should hope. They're, you know, Hope as a wholesale uh, action is, is difficult for them. 
So that's been kind of interesting. I've also been a follower of Ken Homer uh, and, and leave, leaving Facebook and, and don't miss it. On conspiracies, you know, the BB&T Bank did a really interesting thing. They set aside $30 million in their foundation, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but they dribbled it out at $500,000 apiece to really small colleges, economics departments. And all you had to do to have an endowed chair, which means you like, you know, can actually buy a house instead of a TV, you know, cottage or whatever, is teach the values of Ayn Rand in your, uh, in your economics. And so it was, it was directly linked to Ayn Rand thinking, teach, teach the business school that thinking underlying all the spreadsheets and things. And you get, um, you know, uh, you, you get half your salary every year, uh, you know, from, from this bank that wants to keep people ruthlessly focused on old style capitalism. So, you know, those, those things exist. I just happen to know about one of them. Uh, it's a, was a regional bank, now it's a national bank, but, you know, people want people to be, you know, it's a matrix kind of thing, you know, keep, get the matrix of economics taught in at the business schools where half a million counts a lot, you know, it's a, not a, a big school, but it's small schools. So that's really it. Um, you know, that's it, it, it's really stuck with me about whether one was a young woman at Wellesley, it was kind of an exclusive school, and she's in the Madeline uh, Fellowship, which is Madeline Albright, you know, and so then they're really seeing top people doing really good things, but it doesn't conform with how she sees the world and, and is, is, is troubling. And my 17 year old is kind of going back and forth too. They're all going back and forth. They're seeing things that are hopeful, but you know, should 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 teenagers hope, you know, is, is kind of the thing is teenagers to early 20s. So it was a, didn't have a clear answer. I was just sitting with it with them. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. I think it's, there have been other times like this, but it's a very hard time to be young. It's a really hard time to be young. Um, let's go Richard Grace Doug and then back to the queue. Is that me that you were calling on, Jerry? Indeed it is. Okay, great. Thank you. Welcome well, to the call. Thanks for joining us. Yes, my first visit, and so I'm a little hesitant, to, uh, but I thought I could address some things by just a very brief history being that I retired from the EPA at the end of last year, so yay on several counts. But um, I my job during that time was to go into communities that were in potential hazardous situations. Um, I'm a geologist by training, so all this was you know, from going in there, but uh, I found that there are certain patterns, which is that um, potential danger is terrible because you don't know whether to sell your house or you're safe to stay or whatever it is. And um, so uh, fear tends to, uh, I mean, uncertainty tends to create fear and fear is often masked as anger. And uh, so I have worked um, in the last part of my career in participatory mapping. And um, what I'll say about that is this, uh, we use words, we use words like we use the internet. We just assume that they're always here and that they will be supported, <laughs> but that's not true. And uh, one of my examples is horsepower. You know, we say, oh, horsepower, you know, but I don't know who on this call might know, but the way that the word came about was um, taking a horse and hanging a 550 pound weight off a cliff and seeing how much energy it burned to raise that weight one second. So that horsepower became a symbol for an entire hunk of work. And somebody on here said earlier, you know, the anti-vaxxers and then had to pull it back, you know, because that's not really. So um, the deal with participatory mapping is this. You, you get groups of people together that are on a quest for, oh, sorry, I was invited here through Jack Park for does it know? And so I'll use this term and say that uh, you get people together that are organized toward a quest. And I always use building the community park, you know, whatever it is, it could be big, it can be small. But um, and the most important thing that I think about that entire exercise is that they begin by developing a mutual vocabulary. They create a meta community. You know, there's the individuals and just like in a marriage, there's still the marriage, but there's the meta language that goes on. So that's what I'm interested in. And I'll just say that as a, a comment and also a little introduction that, um, you know, I'm interested in having, oh, as Jack and I have talked about quite a bit, we want to be able to create a trust sufficient to accomplish a task or a quest. We don't have to have everybody trusting everybody all the time. We have to have enough trust 
to do that one thing. And one last point that I'll add, oh, uh, two last points. I'm huge into flocks. I believe that cells uh, flock together to form my body. And so I'm amazed every day when I wake up instead of a blob of protoplasm. So cells flock to me, you know, atoms flock. And uh, we flock, obviously, you know, we flock together as communities and all that. And um, there was one other thing I wanted to say, but I think I forgot it, so I better stop. So it's <laughs> nice to meet everybody and I'll look forward to joining y'all uh, as time permits. Um, thanks, Richard, that was great. Uh, really nice to, to meet you and you, you share lots of interests and activities and curiosities with a bunch of us. So uh, it's great to have you in the conversation. Let's go Grace and Doug. Cool. Yeah, welcome. Uh, it's always good to have new people. Um, so I wrote a whole bunch of notes. But yeah. Um, so yeah, you just mentioned this, like Richard just mentioned this word anti-vaxxers and I just you know, I just think it's not an appropriate use of a word because I don't even know what it means now. Like the, the word anti-vaxxer has been attached to anybody who is hesitant about getting this particular treatment, which, which I'm not sure is actually a vaccine. They had to change the dictionary definition in Merriam-Webster um, because the word vaccine has been used differently based on this particular treatment. So yeah, when somebody says anti-vaxxer, I don't know if you're talking about the anti-vaxxers like that as we defined them before COVID or like the people who are hesitant to take vaccines. So, and I think that this has been a propaganda trick to get people who don't fall into the category of opposing a measles vaccine, for example, like to group all these people together. And so I think we need to be careful about vocabulary in that, in that sense. And I guess also on this whole thing about, you know, we were talking about like this conspiracy theory and, you know, they're talking about something I agree with and then they disagree. To me, when somebody has that kind of set of views that I can't match with one another, like they don't belong in that group, to me, that's a sign there's their thinking because they don't belong to a group that, you know, says this is your list of beliefs. And so I don't, I'm, I'm actually kind of refreshed by that. I'm like, okay. They've got some beliefs that belong in this category and some beliefs that belong in that tribe or whatever you call it. They must actually be thinking and not just adopting that from their filter bubble, something like that. So I actually kind of find that a, a, a good phenomenon when I meet, when I meet up with that. Um, and then uh, regarding this, uh, the I just want to say one word about the matter most. The reason I don't use matter most is just the proliferation of different chat things like discord seems to be where everybody is these days i can't do matter most i got slack discord but I, like but i would really prefer a threaded chat to the email lists like the, yeah, i anyway and then with the currency it's interesting i'm just going to kind of say one thing thing cuz monetary currency is a certain thing and i do like the idea of currency as signaling and somebody called me this I, I have a lot of these calls this week talking about her community currency that was to encourage certain community behaviors, regenerative behavior, sharing behavior, whatever. And she was calling them sprinkles. And I'm like, well, sprinkles come in different colors. And I said, you should start, you know, like you might want to start in your community by playing a game where you have different colored monopoly money. And this one means that person, this is an appreciation. Like, I just appreciate you for at least showing up, right? And this one is, but you did a good job, right? Like, it's not just appreciation, but it's actually, you know, outstanding work. And this one is, you know, so I felt like this idea of sprinkles that each one of these signals that we would give to one another or award one another would mean something different, would be much more meaningful in what Pete was talking about, and also in the community as a whole, because we're not really here necessarily to do kind of money business, but those signals, yeah, they could be a lot more nuanced and a lot more interesting in that way. And the great thing about digital is you can kind of track them. One of the things that they found in Giveth, they had, when they first started, they had four different things. And you could give as many of the points as you wanted, and then some people would give two points and some people would give a hundred points. It's like, oh, wait a second. Like, <laughs> what does that mean? Because it was free to give. So yeah, and, and you, could, you could track like, oh, this person always gives a lot of points and appreciates everybody. Maybe their appreciation, thank you, doesn't mean as much as somebody who is stingier with their points. Like if I got a point from so-and-so, you know, that really means something. So it's really, I, I think there's a way to do that in a more nuanced way to do a lot. Um, more interesting signaling 
because one of the things about like I use money to tip people and to also reward them for extra good behavior and also just for, you know, like it's, it mushes it. Anyway, that's, that's what I had to say. It serves many different purposes. Uh, Grace, you're reminding me that uh, the whole, the meta currency project uh, of which holo and the holo currency and all that kind of stuff is a kind of a, a cleaving of a, a piece of a glacier that's floated off into the big oceans. But the meta currency project really covered so many of the things we've been talking about here about um, trust at local scale, uh, about uh, tracking value through communities, about making some sort of reward systems available. It's really interesting. So, so, and I haven't I haven't sort of talked to Art in a really long time, but I'm wondering how much of what they came up with back in the day is has survived the transformation into the holo project and all of those kinds of things but yeah it's interesting. it hasn't um you know it hasn't um some of the people are still doing that but a lot i mean in some ways that's kind of got passed on to me not intentionally but art and i spent quite a long time together and he's really busy with something completely different so oh cool yeah i'd love to find out what um but, well hop chain you know Oh, that, that thing. Yeah, good. I was like, wait, wait he's moved on from Holochain. Um, cool. Um, Doug, uh, you're muted. There you go. Sorry about that. My phone rang. Uh, I have a question to build on Pete's quest for conversational software. And the question is, how come we've I've never heard it mentioned here, but the software that the well runs on is pretty darn good for conversation. Why don't we look at stuff like that? Discourse is not unlike PicoSpan. Yeah. Um, PicoSpan is probably old. I haven't looked at it for three years or whatever, but um, uh, I, well, so we looked at some a, a different way to answer that. We've looked at something that's not unlike PicoSpan. We looked at uh, Discourse. We found it to be uh, super useful and practical, and we didn't use it. <laughs> um, and PicoSpan dates back to the days of the terminal scrolling off your screen, and everybody was you know saving your buffer so you could remember what was said and all that kind of stuff. But it had the thread of discussions that you're talking about, and it was it was a convivial place, partly because of the humans who 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 were in it, who populated it. And, and a bunch of humans who poured a lot of life energy into it and what they thought and so forth. It was a good, it was a good community until it was a, it was a, the well was a good online community until it became the best online community in all the headlines. And then it was like doom from then, then on, which led me to say uh, communities are like mushrooms. Uh, they thrive in dark places like under floorboards and stuff like that. Um, the moment you shine like the, the bright Klieg lights on a, on a community, you're, you're, you're going to screw something up because the, the forces that make it sort of hang together um, are really important. Um, so back to check-ins. We, we have man haven't managed to check in that many people. Go if, ahead, Pete. If, if I may, real quick. Uh, yes. So similar thing, Usenet, uh, some of the, the features and functionality of Usenet for me were like, we, we still haven't reached those, right? So it, it's, it's funny that we have this thing in software products or whatever, uh, software use, uh, where a lot of times stuff that is old had amazing amazing capability and we and we struggle to kind of reinvent it every 10 or 15 years just the way the way the world works um thanks pete so michael gill and actually meant stewart go ahead michael yeah um i wanted to circle back to um, something that was mentioned earlier. Um, uh, well, what, what Mark was saying about the look at me ism um, that is, you know, so much a part of how we are, are forced to function now. Um, you know, the, the idea of living in some kind of, uh, meritocratic um, world where you do what you do and if you do it well and you hang out your shingle, you know, you'll, you'll do okay. Um, and, and calling attention to yourself and, you know, waving your hands a lot and running through the street was not, not done, 
you know, you wouldn't you wouldn't go to a doctor who uh, who ran through the street and you know said, "Hey, these are my views on this, and these are my views on that." But now, um, if if somebody's not raising their profile, doctors might have been a bad example. But you know, um, if somebody's not raising their profile, they're not heard from. And it, you know, I was thinking about about how Shoshana Zuboff talks about land going from the commons to a commodity and that attention has done likewise. Um, and, you know, we weren't, we weren't terribly, we didn't hoard our attention and meet it out. It was, you know, abundant and freely shared um, when there wasn't so much to pay attention to maybe. And now the war for our attention is on um, and it's being, you know, our attention is being staked out um, by, you know, first, first by, by television. And, you know, we used to be amazed that, oh my God, there are people who spend, you know, six hours a day watching television, how unhealthy. And, um, and the same people who were, who were stunned by that once upon a time now spend more time than that on their devices. Um, and, and the people who are fighting for how much attention we spend on their app and devices are the, the land grabbers um, in this rush. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't know how, how we solve that. And, and you know, it also, I think, speaks to the the IP rush and staking out, you know, your claim to some way of doing one thing so that, you know, and trying to get everybody to do it your way instead of instead of sharing that. Um, yeah, just wanted to, to share that thought. And uh, and and as regards um, Facebook and that and that piece that you shared, Pete, um, about how it changes the circles. I caught myself um, this morning just checking in on Facebook, which I do because of my old friends who I am there with. And um, one of my best friends, you know, who I went to elementary school with, who, you know, toasted at my wedding and, and you know, dear friend um, just became a grandmother and posted a picture of her her new grandchild and i clicked the heart you know button and just felt this rush of sadness that you know one of the people that i'm closest to informed me of this important fact in her life through this platform and I responded with the least effort possible, a, you know, a single click of my mouse. Um, and, and Facebook won, you know, Facebook um, now knows a little bit, you know, triangulates a little bit more about me and, and who's important to me and what's important to me and can, you know, even if I'm not expressing that much of my personal interests, they know a little bit better that they might cleave a little bit closer to that person. Um, and yeah, so sharing that feeling. And uh, lastly, I, I wanted to talk about um, and, and, and push the question, you know, Grace's sprinkles, um, uh, or, you know, her friend Sprinkles and, and the idea of um, currencies that are, that mean different things um, that, that came out of that. I, I, I think there's a lot to that. Um, and, you know, the upvotes, the likes, the claps on Medium, and that problem that you have when people have an unbounded amount of them uh, of, you know, what does it mean that I clapped you know, twice and somebody else clapped a hundred times and, you know, how, 
you know, should I have a limited quality based on how much I post? Well, that penalizes the, the thoughtful lurker who isn't a poster a lot and doesn't garner, you know, likes and claps, but wants to, wants to value other people's work with their, um, with putting it out. Um, and I don't, I don't know how we, how we solve for that one, but I, I do think it's an avenue to explore. Um, that's, that's very cool. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Yeah. Really good stuff. A, a, a small, I guess, ironic note, which is that um, handwritten postcards and greeting cards have appreciated. Like when you actually, in this era of, hey, I could have just clicked on the heart, when you sit down and write a note and do whatever, like, like the value of that has actually gone up because that used to be the thing you did by default. And now it's like, oh my God, oh my God, are you serious? You pulled out a sheet of paper and a pen and you remember how to handwrite and you put a, you licked a stamp? That's crazy. Nobody does that. Like, you know, the, the, the strange worlds we're in. Um, and it looks like we're not going to make uh, the full round of check-in. I apologize for that, but, but uh, let's go. Um, uh, who did I have in the queue? Gil Stewart Julian. Gil's gone. And Gil's gone. I'm, I'm looking around going, wait, wait, where's Gil? Where's Gil? Uh, Stuart, Julian, John. Great. So, um, so what pops up for me is, is uh, as a check-in is um, much to my surprise over the past seven or eight years, uh, I think I've become a good Buddhist and that's what keep me, that's what keeps keeping me um, upright and not not crazy. It's like you know the the dialogue, the conversation about vaxxers and anti-vaxxers. It doesn't engage me at all. Um, you know, bottom line, I think it's silly not to get vaccinated based upon all of the the numbers that are coming out. And you know, people can can you know pick at each other back and forth as much as they want. Um, you know, I just realized that I've been going strong for like 57 years and uh, um, it's time to just accept a little bit of elderhood and, 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 and sit back and watch uh, some of what's going on and, you know, do what you can um, with what you have where you are seems to, you know, really ha have, have sunk in. Uh, I'm, I'm leaving for Mexico tomorrow morning on a week long urban vacation in Mexico City where I've never been just to kind of enjoy the city. Um, I've been traveling a little bit here and there. You know, I'm not, I'm not concerned about getting sick. I'm more concerned about getting stuck out of the country. Um, but, you know, what will, what will be, um, will be. Um, I, I feel kind of fortunate in a certain way that the little world that I've created seems to be working. It seems to be making some contributions here or there. And, um, and that's my check-in and thank you for the opportunity. Cool, Stuart, thank you. Uh, if you have a chance, do go to the Archaeological Museum. It's yeah. like insane. Um, and also realize that Mexico City was a floating city, that, that originally yeah. it was a floating island that then got settled in, yep. which leads to some weird things in the present. <laughs> like, like parts of the city or buildings that are settling by a couple inches a year sort of thing. It's like not good as they pump up the aquifer that actually gets worse and so it's a really fascinating city yep. uh, enjoy your travels Thank so you. let's go um julian <clears throat> julian john scott uh so my check-in is that i mentioned a couple of weeks ago i've been working on an actual description of my project venturi which i've been talking about for years and now was finally pushed to put down uh actually on paper although not with a pen i'm still using uh software but anyway, it's, it's taken a while. It reminds me of the Mark Twain quote about, you know, I would have written you a short letter, but I didn't have the time. So, and that has been the emphasis on trying to keep this proposal from turning into a book was taking the time to make sure that it did turn out to be that, that short letter. So I'm happy to report it's about 90% done, hoping to finish today even, so. Sounds great, eager to see it. Um, and Mark is celebrating. Uh, let's go, John Scott Mark. Okay, just a, a quick note, uh, partly in response to Stuart. Yeah, I I would prefer not to be even paying any attention to the 
vax, anti-vax, all that kind of stuff. But the problem is that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm family members, you know, and, and also I have, I've got the full range. I've got the brilliant, but arguably, you know, you look at their sources, people who have deep, deep, deep conspiracy stories. And then moving along, I've got people say, well, no, no, of course, you know, no, I'm, I'm, I'm for vaccines, but this one wasn't done right. You know, this one was rushed and there's some stuff they didn't tell us. And there's some stuff about here, you know, no. and so it's like, it's like, how do you deal with that? You know, you make your own decision. Okay. I'm going to go this way. I, I understand it's, it's not a, not a black and white case, but I'm going to go this way. But then you have to make the decision of, okay, I'm going to be in meetings. Some of these meetings are going to have people who are at a greater health risk than me some of the, we know that the people in those meetings are not vaccinated we know that they're not so keen about wearing a mask so what do we do it's it's the question of how do you manage that the very human process of mixing up your body with other bodies and vac vaccinated not vaccinated mask not masked indoors um, not a it might be helpful. I don't know that everybody knows that you were heavily involved in elder care and you're around vulnerable populations all the time. Like this, this is sort of what you've been doing for years. Yes, th th that is. But, and actually the, I don't run into the issue as much in my, with my elder clients, cause it's just, we're doing it. We've done it. We're doing it. There's, there, there's no objecting. There's no non-vax. There's no anti-vax in my client base. It's on my family, which is much more complicated because of course you're going to get together as a family. And of course there's relatives and some of those relatives are, are uh, older and vulnerable, you know, mm -hmm. and how do you deal with that? So that it's, I don't have any answers, you know, but I mean, we just, we, you try to listen, you try to say, okay, try to say, where would, you know, um, that's really complicated, but, but I told my sister, I said, look, if you got sick and if i know you're not happy about the western medical system but we would push it as hard as we could to get you the best care that we could and i was trying to just express my, both concern but also competent concern for her situation um knowing you can't it's like the kid asks you you know is everything going to be all right or the russians going to invade you? you you can't answer you know <laughs> you have to say it's okay it's okay i i will support you i can't say what's going to happen but you have my support that's the that's the only thing you can do in a situation like that mm -hmm. uh one quick personal note that's very off from anything we've been discussing is um <laughs> in in a novel i'm writing i have three spaceships one of them has Robert Kennedy in it. One of them has John F. Kennedy in it. They each have a coach. They each have a a, a cantor, which is a HAL. You know, the, the, the ship itself is a robot. And uh, the Martin Luther King ship didn't make it just because I can't write, you know, what Martin Luther King would say. I'm having a hard enough time writing what Robert Kennedy would say under certain circumstances. I tried pseudo write. Interesting. I would like to find a way. I'm, I'm sure there's a way to do it. Uh, it might be expensive, too expensive, because I look at the uh, the rates on GP33 tokens. But I would love to, to not just take the Kennedys, but take the heroes or the consciences of the people that I'm writing about and bring in the writing about the conscience person and put the conscious person writing into the computer and basically have that be a character in my story. So as a, for instance, <laughs> the, the computer in the John F. Kennedy ship, which is called New Frontier, the computer by, is not named by him. It's named by his coach, who's named Monica. And Monica decides that the computer is going to be named Norma Jean. Now, why do that? Well, because she hmm. wants to get she wants to you know say listen uh there's some stuff you need to face about your past and uh i'm not going to hit you on the head with it but i'm gonna you're not going to get away with not facing it okay so i'm looking for a way to take everything written about marilyn monroe get it in gpt3 
and use that as a basis for having some dialogue between the coach, John F. Kennedy, and their computer. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I can pull it off, but it's, it's certainly fun to think about. It is. It's a cool quest. Yeah. Um, Stacy, Thank you. you want to, thanks, John. Stacy, you want to jump in? Yeah, that was interesting, John. Um, just going to the COVID thing. Um, if, if the, the, for me, the biggest problem was that there were people that did get sick when they got injected, and there was never any opportunity for them to discuss this. It was immediately shut down. So very, very, very small percentage. But if these companies were not doing the right thing by them, something should have been put in place so that let's say you're part of this trial. There's a fund. So if you get sick, we will address it. That wasn't done. I guess what I'm trying to say is the more you fight to silence somebody, the more you energize the message they're trying to say. And that's where the division comes from. So I kind of take the role that Stuart takes. I don't, everybody knows what's right for them. I kind of take that position, but I still look to find a common solution, whether that's we'll make sure you're wearing a mask. But the the whole thing that everything was silenced in the beginning, I think was a big problem. At this point, I don't know how that gets unraveled. But I just want to mention it because it happens with other things as well. And it it starts on an individual level just when we're having our one-on-one -on -one conversations. I would love to be a fly on the wall for an after action review on pandemic strategies, country by country by country by country. Like what would you have done differently with like smart, honest people sort of thinking, ooh, this is where we really screwed up. And then we screwed this up and then, and then damn, and this happened. Um, That's a hell of a qualifier, Jerry, smart, honest people. I'm, you know, where are you gonna find that? I keep searching in the town square, it's really hard. <laughs> So th there's a guy, and I, I may have my Greek history mixed up, but um, there's a fellow who stands in front of the local Safeway, which is only a couple blocks away, and uh, is always wrapped in, in blankets and with sandals. And it, it, he'll be out there in cold weather. He's out there all the time. He never speaks. He waves at people. He smiles a lot. He's got a beard. And he's looked the same now for, I don't know, three, four years. And I kind of call him Diogenes um, as I walk by, but um, it's hard. Um, let's go Scott, Mark, Ken, and then uh, we're probably going to not make it that far into that list. Okay, um, I'll make this pretty quick. So regarding attention and why um, everybody's after it, attention and paying for it, you know, obviously scarcity increases valuation. And the less that we have, the more it's worth to people, I think. Um, and... It's interesting, the idea about sharing on Facebook made you a little, or liking on Facebook makes you a little, feeling a little like queasy about that. And yet, you know, here's Jerry with 470,000 thoughts that are publicly available to anyone at any time. So it's interesting, he's almost hidden in the flood. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, there's all those opinions, but wow, that's just, that's too many. I'm not even gonna go look at that. Um, and Jerry, I was just listening to your interview with Fritz, which I believe was posted a month ago. I don't know. That's what I was doing the first half of this call. Oh, cool. And one of the things came up to me, and I, I don't have an answer for it. It's just something I want to throw out there, is the idea I keep hearing how things are broken. And to me, I think that that's a word that we need to dive into at some point, because to me, broken means something was working. And that it's now not working and it needs to be repaired to its former state. That to me says, that's, that's my definition of broken. Okay, this thing was broken and now it needs to be fixed. And what I'm wondering is like, okay, so when we say that if that's true, then what state is it that was, was so ideal that we want to return to it? And is that a nostalgia problem? Or is it something new that you're trying to create? And in that sense, you're not fixing in the sense that fixing something that was broken. You're moving from one state to another. And it's from one state to a different state instead of returning to a previous whole state. So it's just a word I'm, I'm challenging the group on. 
and that's it for me. Thanks, John. You're reminding me of why I don't really like sustainability and resilience and why I prefer thriving and flourishing. And that is that, that to me, sustainability and resilience are like a rubber band. They, they're, they imply taking some kind of impact and then cut, snapping back to where you were before, where thriving and flourishing allow for the reshaping of what's happening and, and responses and systems and whatever else and to, to make things better. So um, words, we're back to words. Um, and I think I had Mark and then Ken. Yeah, um, I continue to uh, attempt to think. Um, I've rejoined this group, uh, the Lyceum Institute. It is a group of Catholic philosophers, um, Catholic in the in the religious or Jesuitical um, or Dominican kind of uh, uh, form of uh, even Thomas. Uh, they're actually um, St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, nuts, man, they're crazy about Aquinas. Um, and, uh, it's fascinating. I mean, certainly there's, uh, conversations about abortion that I'm not particularly fond of, but, um, uh, I am taking a course, um, on, uh, Yuri Lottman and, uh, John Dealey and cultural semiotics, which uh, in universities, semiotics is uh, um, woolly and wild. And I was hoping this one would be a little less so, and it is a little less so, but basically, you know, how do, uh, what are the meaning structures of culture? And uh, um, it's fascinating and confusing and I will pass um, in the interest of time. Thanks, Mark. I'm Ken. So we're going past our, our end time? Just by a little bit. Just, Just by a little bit. Um, I'll keep this brief. Uh, I'm, I'm noticing that um, one thing the pandemic has done, that years of positive psychology and all sorts of other things and Buddhism failed to do is I've really shifted my focus to what I'm grateful for. Uh, this came about about two months into the pandemic when uh, my wife and I were just complaining, oh, we can't go to live music, we can't go to the theater, we can't do this, can't do that. And I'm, so, you know, we're going to go crazy if all we do is talk, think about things we can't do. Let's start to focus on what we're grateful for. You know, Netflix and Zoom, thank God, I, I, I can be entertained and I can connect with people here, you know. So I've really been making it a daily practice to find things that I'm grateful about. And one of those right now is I'm really grateful that I have some paying work. Um, so uh, I, I have a couple of clients and potential for a couple more. And um, so I've, I've, in the time that I'm not wasting, no longer wasting on Facebook, I've been, I've been, you know, doing some actual work and it just feels really good to come into the new year with, with some work. Um, and I'm also really grateful that we've passed the solstice and I can see the days getting longer and it's brighter. And that just always makes me feel good. Um, and groups like this, you know, I feel so blessed to be part of a, a community where I have, you know, these brilliant people to come and talk with and listen to and learn with and learn from. And um, I'm going to be in New York um, uh, in a couple of weeks. And um, Stacy and Mark and Wendy are all going to come and visit me and have dinner. And I was like, you guys in the middle of the pandemic are going to come out. I just, I feel so, you know, it, it really touches my heart. So I'm, I'm grateful for, for these sorts of things and really happy to be, um, you know, still alive. And, and, you know, I sat last night, my wife was working and I having dinner by myself and I always have a moment, you know, we take a moment for a meal and I just sat there, I take a moment for myself. And I just, I thought to myself, you know, it is a privilege to eat. There are so many people throughout in the world now and throughout history who have gone hungry. And I'm sitting here with a full plate and I just absorbed, you know, I'm, I, I am privileged in this moment in time to have enough. And maybe I don't have everything I want, but I got enough and that is enough. And, you know, I'm very concerned about the state of the world, but I'm sitting in, someone just said, do what I can with what I have where I am. And that's what I'm focused on. And I'm not letting the, the doom porn overwhelm me. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. And I, I think that's a lovely, lovely note to end our call on. Um, Julian. Uh, Ken, what you were just saying about enough, this is something I'd like to bring up at, at some point because it's really uh, driven home to me in Denmark, but it would take, well, it's 9.33 already. So maybe think of that for the future, so. Um, and the topic of enough is lovely and, and wide and deep, so we, we should step back into it.
Um, thank you, everybody. It's been I'm I'm really grateful for our conversations, for our time together, for all the things we kick up and turn around. Until soon. See ya.